initial questions for any of them from all of you? Or we can begin with. Uh, oh, I'll start. Oh, please. Yeah. Now, I was terribly interested in the number of questions for the dog. Whether you had a huge right. investment in the choices or they were completely arbitrary? Um, they're not arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> But I won't definitively say anything uh, except that, I guess. <laughs> Without a complete lack of any tens. Um, I don't know. I mean, how many things are really perfect that you see? Was there a nine? No. <laughs> I would like, the one thing I'd like to say is no rating doesn't necessarily mean it's so bad I can't rate it. It's just unrateable. So. <laughs> Well, did you own any of these dogs? Did I what? Did you own any of no. these? No. <laughs> well, let's talk for both Mariah and Mark uh, about the genesis of each of your films. Mariah, as we've shown yours here before in a different context as well. Uh, but if you could tell us about that and then also how it works for you differently in this different context. Um, <coughs> well, the this film, actually, I'm embarrassed to say I worked on it for like four years. <laughs> it's only like 15 minutes long, but um, it started just because <coughs> I, I saw the work of this guy, Peter Berlin, and became interested in him and tried to copy him, basically, um, by dressing up like him. And then put it aside for a while and came back to it um, after having this anxiety dream about him and then put it away for a while and then came back to it um, when I figured out how to actually meet him. So it kind of, it's actually assembled in the order that it was made. Um, and I had thought about mixing it up in a different way, but it sort of worked best, I thought, um, just chronologically like that. Um, and the second question was how... What place did you find? The first time we showed it was in a program mm -hmm. called Dirty Looks, which was looking at new queer-related works. And obviously this is contextually different, but I was wondering if that yeah. affects your view of it or how you, how you think it might play differently in these different contexts, or does that really matter? Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it played differently in, in the two different contexts. The first so the other context I showed it here was a, a screening series called Dirty Looks, which is a queer experimental screening series. And it was shown with a film of Zachary Drucker's, one of Chris Vargas's, and one of um, Matt Wolf's. And all of the films were looking at um, sort of older figures in queer history. Um, so it was really sort of philosophically and structurally in line with these other films that it played with. Um, they all had like sort of very similar um, a very sim similar genesis, and in this context, just now, it's like completely different from that first context. Um, I mean, it doesn't change the way I feel about the film, but it was interesting to see it um, in. I mean, this program seemed to be like, sort of like highly image based in comparison to the other one, which was very sort of more narratively driven. Um, so it was interesting to see how it played with uh, that kind of work. Especially uh, Catherine Rainey's film. Mm -hmm. where she's looking at this to her kind of mythic figure <clears throat> and trying to have some kind of interaction with yeah. her. And actually that, I, I was thinking, I've had the great pleasure of seeing a lot of David's programming at Ann Arbor and with the touring show. And <coughs> I, I would actually love, if you don't mind, to talk about your programming process because it feels very intuitive but also very uh, also intellectually aware of the d different connections the work might have. And, like a lot of these <laughs> films really felt really interesting together in a really smart way. Uh, well, that's it's good. Um, good I, thanks. <laughs> this is the, honestly, this is the first time um, that I've been able to um, see this program with an audience. And I think, um, I don't know if maybe Adam, you might agree that, like, um, I think just from my experience uh, programming film, that, um, you know, you get to know. Uh, films intimately and can you know view them together alone but it doesn't really it doesn't really become real until it's watched uh, I think with 
in, in this kind of setting, this communal setting. So often you have an idea of how things um, feel uh, connected, um, and, but to uh, it's really not known until it's experienced. Um, that said, uh, um, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's difficult to talk about. Um, it's intuitive uh, where I, I would say like there's connections. Um, I think there are, um, could be connections found between uh, all the works. Um, and then some of those might be um, narrative or, or conceptual and then others really more formal and some of them even just sonically. Um, and then as I'm experiencing this, these 12 films together, um, you know, s some of those connections um, are uh, more pronounced, so the more formal connections become pronounced, and then the next uh, film uh, sequence, or s you know, two or three films in a row might, might have more of a conceptual thread. Um, but I, I, th this feels pretty loose for me, and... Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's it's a touring program. So you know, all these, all twelve of these films were shown at the last festival, but that was in the context of um, you know, 130 new films. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't put these twelve films together. <laughs> you know, at the festival, I had the um, luxury of of um, drawing upon a lot of other works, and and so you know, this this just feels very wide, um, but. You know, I, I mean, even the, you know, like the 106 uh, River Road following your film, I'm not quite sure about how I feel about that. I remember what I was thinking, you know, where there's like a tension between order and disorder in Mark's film and then in the 106 River Road. I'm still not sure. <laughs> I might change this after. But, um, you know, that, that was more of a conceptual threat as opposed to formal. Hey, please. Well, it's just a question about that first piece of uh, footage that was in part of the logo, I mean the opening so yeah. And so I'm watching it and I'm thinking, okay, it's it's you know, like that energy, the Beatles energy. So is this Peter Lennon is some relation should we them running after the Beatles? What was that? Or is that just some weird association? Uh, well Ral Cotard uh, passed okay. away and uh, you know, I I was really struck by Rocky Road to Dublin and that's a, that's really it. Okay. And you know it we have to have something for the projectionist to figure out masking and focus and you know all that kind of thing so and to attach uh, the underwriters for the festival to so you know i mean that that's about as far as that went yeah i mean you know I, the, that scene in the film is re really remarkable it's a remar remarkable piece of cinema so we we felt okay about hijacking it for this <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but for a long time the touring package had no connection to any of the festival winners, any of the things that the judges had awarded. It was completely independent of any of that and completely up to whoever happened to be the curator for the package. And um, well, it, it always seemed that, that um, there was very little consideration given to the fact that the touring package um, might go to a lot of places where people weren't really familiar with or well versed in experimental cinema and, and didn't necessarily uh, consider that you know you, the, the tour package might want to be somewhat more accessible to the general public than uh, you know the, the more abstract, the more uh, structural, the more uh, inaccessible to you know pieces. Has, has there been a lot of conversation among the festival? Uh, principles about that? Um, well, the, the tour has always been organized by the festival director or organizers, um, uh, so that hasn't changed. But not um, connected to the awards? No, the, I mean, usually it includes um, 
uh, some of the... So for those that know, uh, the festival um, has a kind of films and competition, and there's a three-person uh, jury that looks at all the contemporary films from the last two years, and then they give out um, you know, uh, awards. So uh, Despedida, was, uh, uh, Alexander Cuesta's film was the one best cinematography. Mariah's film won uh, uh, LGBTQ out, uh, award. Um, another of Mark's films, not this one, uh, received a jury award. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, I mean, the, I find that I agree with some of the jury's choices and the films that they, um, you know, so how, those are always going to end up probably in the tour, or some of them, so, yeah. Um, as far as accessibility, I mean, um, I don't know what the ticket prices were, but you're all here. It's accessible. You know, <laughs> you, you made it in the door. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't. I mean, the films do show like in a lot of college, um, university settings, and you know, I think the faculty that brings the tour in probably does some kind of setup or discussion <laughs> after. Um, I, I don't. I don't find this inaccessible. You're very well versed in this stuff. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think there's a lot of ways to enter the work, and there's a lot of entry points. Um, I don't, I don't think this is for specialists. You know, I think, I think a lot of the, you know, I mean, some of the, yeah, I mean, some of the works are, you know, have a degree of, um, where I think maybe familiarity with uh, history of avant-garde cinema is beneficial, but I don't think it's a requisite. But I mean, I could be wrong. You know, you tell me. Do you think with what, uh, well, the, the specifics of this program are, say, is it an apt reflection of so, sort of the overall range of work being um, made in this sort of vein? Since you, obviously in the course of programming the festival, you see a, you know, <laughs> one could argue, the most complete possible range of work being done yeah. in this vein. Well, like, um, I mean, it, it precludes longer form work. Um, you know, obviously this is um, artists that are working in 16 millimeter, so that, you know, um, but, uh, you know, tonally, yeah. I mean, I think it's not the widest range, but it's, it's representative. But you saw the festival, I don't know what I'm saying. It's pretty incredibly diverse, I think, but it's true, when you're gonna create a touring package, uh, I mean, there's so much to draw on, but, there are a lot of limitations too, like for line. I mean, there's some amazing films that might be like, say, 55 minutes long, and I mean, if you put that in the touring package, then you're going to grossly limit the diversity of the program. So, I mean, there are a lot of things you have to consider when you're putting it together. I imagine, but yeah, I mean, 16 millimeter is funny these days because more people, it seems to me now are interested in it and working in it, or just in film in general, than were, say, maybe 10 years ago, even though it's at a more endangered uh, state. And part of that interest, I think, that a lot of people have is the textural quality of it. Because video, it, I mean, no matter what kind of video, the image itself is an abstracted signal. Whereas film, you can actually see the image, you can work with it. And I mean, some of these works were material blown up from smaller gauges, like in Catherine Ramey's, there's 8mm film blown up to 16mm, and or sometimes left as 8mm when you see the quadrants, and people using different stocks and hand processing it. So there, I felt like there was an attention, like you mentioned, uh, it was heavily visual, um, which I think is true, but part of that I think has to do with people working in 16mm are very aware of the medium, uh, which is a difficult medium, and it's but it's a very physical medium, and. So in a way, I also feel like more work than ever is dealing with the image and the physicality of it, if it's if people are working in film. Well, so why did you choose to work in 16 for these particular films? Um, you know, in my case, I don't know if I really have a good reason, because that film could have totally been made in video in a way, but there's something about, I mean, technically it could have been, but there's something about having it in 16, there's a level of removal that I think, and maybe it's a little romantic or sentimental, in, at least in the case of this movie, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think it's a pretty silly movie that I made, but there is a way that it becomes slightly wistful for me, in the way that when you're recording, when you're shooting film, you're not recording sound in sync directly on the film as you would generally with video, 
And so the fact that you're recording this kind of silent moving image sequence and then like, the, like I, you know, I put the music on there just to give it sort of an atmosphere, I guess. But it, yeah, there, there was something um, that seemed more substantial and maybe a little romantic about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, I really hope you make a sequel, but, <laughs> but um, I would really like to see one. Um, I used 16 for my project because, um, well, I used the same camera that Peter Berlin used for the movies, for his own movies. Um, so he shot porno movies of himself on 16 millimeter and then also um, photographs on film, still photographs on film, that were these double exposure self-portraits of himself with himself. Um, Oh, he did these double exposure self-portraits of himself, like, in sexual <laughs> situations with himself, and so I was try sort of, like, trying to follow him, his lead and um, use the medium and the camera even that he, he had used. But also that first part, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't intended to do the sort of, like, hand manipulation to the first section, but he, he would do that on his own photographs when he didn't like how they turned out, or if there was like a bad exposure, he would paint on top of them. Um, or if he didn't like his outfit, he'd like color it in. So um, I started doing that because the footage made me really uncomfortable to just watch unadulterated. So um, I started erasing, <laughs> yeah, erasing and masking up parts of it, which I could not have done if I had done it on video. In the back up there. <coughs> I know Gary Fialka, who I think originated <coughs> the uh, Ann Arbor Film Festival, so I'd like to talk to him and see whether this is typical of what he used to show. And probably not PC, but to my way of thinking, this was like the cinematic version of The Emperor Has No Clothes. I've been watching so-called experimental films for over 50 years, and I've been bored out of my gourd with scratchy, unfocused leader <laughs> stuff for over 50 years. Uh, when I was looking at most of these, I got the feeling that Warhol's Chelsea Girls and Sleep all of a sudden became a lot clearer and more interesting than when I remember seeing them. I, I just uh, didn't get any feeling that there was any coherent uh, follow through in virtually all of the films and I'll just say that the one I did like was the dogs but I also felt that uh, there was no way of assessing correct ratings for some of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, it wasn't really a question but yeah I mean, we could probably all respond to that. We should respond to that. Well the only response I had was uh, uh, Jerry Falco was um, I th he was uh, he was involved with the actually the Ann Ar Arbor uh, eight millimeter uh, film festival. Um, you know he, I think late like maybe in the second decade of the festival, um, he was, uh, you know he was involved with the, as a volunteer. But that's that's the extent of it. Now the person who started the festival is uh, it's George Menupelli, um and he he uh, started that in uh, 1963. Um, there's another, um, you know, there are a number of other people um, in the, especially in the first uh, ten years that were pretty instrumental. One of those is Jay Cassidy, who's um, kind of pretty uh, well established as a um, as an editor. Actually, I have a question though. I'm just curious because you mentioned you've been bored out of your gourd by this stuff for 50 years. I'm 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 impressed that you keep coming, but why is it that you keep coming? to see the work. I don't say I'm bored out of my gourd for the film forum. I'm bored out of my gourd for watching the same repetitive, scratchy leader stuff. I don't even know why they took the lens cap off because I didn't see anything coming through. So Did you come to the I other some, program some by any chance, which was all digital video? Oh, we Yeah, we did a digital video show from Ann Arbor in December with a a different array of work as well. But hopefully it come to more shows as yeah, well, I mean, a wider variety. Of because, yeah, no, there's, sure, there, there's certainly a certain amount of work in this program that, again, I, I feel like paid attention to the medium, which is this thing that has texture and can be scratched and manipulated by hand. And, and I think, again, because we're in an era where that's kind of unusual, I mean, we're, most people aren't engaging with moving image media in that kind of physical way. It's very removed and very abstracted <laughs> and digital and computers and all this kind of stuff that 
I think people find um, a certain power and a potential maybe emotional resonance that can be achieved by working with the medium in that way because it's it's not the, our everyday experience of, of images anymore. So, you know, it can suggest a lot of things for people, I think. So I, 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 I do find a lot of that kind of work going on in 16 millimeter, but, and yeah, sometimes it is repetitive and sometimes it's maybe not very creative, but a lot of times it's pretty damn amazing and pretty uh, emotionally resonant for me at least. Um, like actually the, the Josh uh, Weisbach film I thought was great because you're you're looking at the single image of this house which has been manipulated in actually quite a beautiful way just by hand processing the film but then the soundtrack is this strange kind of uh, this form that he's just sort of reading in this extremely kind of rote way but as you kind of uncover what he's reading you realize it's got this great kind of emotional uh, distress laden with it because it's his parents and some kind of restraining order and we don't know why but we know that that's kind of an upsetting thing for him but it's I don't know I thought that was an interesting way to mix uh, that textural approach to the film with uh, the emotional content that he was trying to I mean if he had a very clear image maybe it wouldn't have um, worked for him I mean there's in a way something that he's sort of trying to deal with that's hidden for him emotionally too so not to go on or try to speak for that guy, but for Josh, but I don't know. There, was your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious why you guys separated the, the 16 millimeter and the digital and the terrain. Uh, it's just, it's really just practical. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, just, yeah, it's just really difficult for, um, just for venues to uh, do mix program, uh, especially for uh, projectionists that, um, Often, uh, out, you know, like outside of the festival, won't have time to prepare uh, or kind of do a, a run through. Really, is the festival concerned at all with like the distilling of audiences that that causes? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I mean that there's there seems to be like a certain kind of people that show up at the 16 millimeter one versus the digital one, and I. I'm just curious if that's something the festival will take into consideration. I think in the it's, it's news to me. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> oh, what, what, how would you define the kind of people that show up? <laughs> <laughs> Did you come to the digital park? <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, so like in the festival itself, yeah, things things are, um, I, things are, yeah, just definitely. It's it's not organized by medium. Uh, or form format, you know. So yeah, I mean, so it's unusual. It's not. This isn't representative of how works are presented uh, in the festival. But this is just as far as the touring thing. Um, I mean, what had happened was the, um, you know, when video was introduced, the the tour started to mix those. But we found that it was just really um, difficult for venues to accommodate. And then the, I wasn't involved with the festival yet. They just killed the 16. Um, so when I got involved, I really thought that that was too much of a loss. And, six, you know, there's a, I mean, the fe I, in the inter introduction, I said the festival is committed to 16. What I'm really trying to say is the festival is committed to artists that are making interesting work. A lot of that is on um, in this format. And I and there's a lot of great venues that can <coughs> exhibit this, you know, like, like we're here now. So you know, yeah, there's a distillation or, or sort of segregation there, but, you know, it's better than the work not being seen. So. I mean, one issue that I know comes up is that there are, let's say, a DC, decreasing number of venues that can exhibit 16 millimeter. And so if you mix the two in a show, for example, what is, what is the organization that is choosing to program it simply isn't going to show some of the pieces that's possible yeah. or they're... I mean, universities, most universities, you know, don't show 16 millimeter anymore. Hmm. And many of the places the tour is picked up is at universities. So, uh, yes. I have a question about the Peter Berlin one. Um, first off, is that, what's the mansion in the middle? Is that what he lives in or just? That's the house across the street from my apartment building. <laughs> okay, because I love that mansion, so I was just curious about it. Second of all, was he, the story about the hug and that kind of stuff, was that with him, or just... Well, I've been instructed not to, like, answer this question, but I won't <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> I, uh, that second part was based on 
um, an anxiety dream I had about what it would be like to meet him because I was afraid of meeting him because he's this reclusive guy now who um, is kind of this imposing figure. Um, but he turned out to be really sweet and accommodating and answered all my questions and let me stay as long as I wanted at this house. Um, so that second part was sort of this, um, it's like the opposite of a fantasy. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it was this anxiety. It was, you know, I think of it as moving from like idolization to anxiety to like an actual touchdown with reality. Um, but that section it was the images are all from my neighborhood. So um, I just I really like the way people light up their houses and their plants. And and I live in this Ar Armenian neighborhood, and um, the store windows are all really ornate and lit up at night. So there's like this parallel I see with the architecture in my neighborhood and the commercial. Um, sore windows, basically, that all has to do with, like, monumentality, which kind of reminded me of him. So, um, that's what that section, <laughs> the second section is all about. It's funny, because I think in the, if I heard it correctly, um, he, when the guests come in while you're doing the interview or talk, conversation, he, he says, like, we've already climbed that, so <laughs> <laughs> it lends this plausibility to your yeah. your dream. Yeah, it, it was really weird, actually, that he had, like, a little black stallion, just like I had dreamt about, um, and he made that joke, like, completely unprompted. He hadn't seen the second part, so... Um, Has he seen the movie? You know, I keep trying to give it to him, but I don't think he's actually seen it. I, I, um, he has like a friend who's the guy who answers all his emails, and I don't know, it's complicated. But I've given him a copy of it. But I ran into him at the Mocha Show, and he told me he didn't at the the Tom of Finland Mocha Show. That's up. Is it still? Up? Uh, yeah, it's still up. Um, and he told me he never got it, so I've got to send another <laughs> copy. Robin. Uh, so three things. So just to finish with, about this film. So. How, how much time do you actually spend in the second part with him? Um, the, the second part? The, well, that, I guess the part when, when he's there, when he's talking, oh. the, yeah, that, I mean, just, when that it went from dream or, or whatever you mm -hmm. call it, to the actuality of being with him in that space, and I, you said it spread out over four years, I'm trying to figure out how that went out. Um, that was probably like six months or a year later, um, and then I only spent a couple hours with him in his apartment. It's a really beautiful film. And then I had two other questions. Well, one, I just want to say, I don't know what this means, Mark, but for some reason, more than often than not, I knew what number you were going to give those dogs. So I don't know what that means. That means great minds think alike, baby. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely understood, I think I understood some of the personalities of these dogs. Okay, and then the last thing is, I'm curious about... I can't pronounce this. I will go Iseva. Can you say a little bit more about that filmmaker and give you more about that? I, I that's um, this is the first film that um, I've seen of her. Uh, I know she's in the Boston area. I think she I think she's fairly young. Um, and might be like a, a graduate from Emerson and maybe teaching in the area. But I, I really um, in a lot of filmmakers come to the festival, and she couldn't make it, so I didn't really have a chance to meet her, really talk with her. So, yeah. Which one's that? That's uh, the film Ayalgo Iseva by Kimberly Forero. The meal with the family coming together and the repetitive music. And... Yeah. 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 Uh, I, this is sort of a dumb question, but how, uh, you said you had about 127 works in the show? Um, like a hundred, yeah, yeah. So how many actually submitted? It, it's um, it's in the thousands. So, yeah. Would you say the, uh, over the years, do you keep records of the? I mean, I'm wondering how popular experimental film is today. Would it, or would that? Um. With, Keep records of of the of works. How many people submit? That would suggest how many filmmakers are into experimental film. Um, well, we do show some, uh, like, you know, do, you know, nonfiction, documentary, right, yeah. all kinds of, uh, and some fiction films. So that um, 
attracts people that that wouldn't um, identify their work as experimental or they're not coming from that. Um, that said, I, I mean, even um, this year, I mean, there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of people making works that you would sort of identify as you know uh, kind of coming from this sort of avant-garde um, uh, milieu. Yeah, I would say even more than. You know, I, and some, you know, I mean, I think if, well, like, if you think about when the festival began in um, 1963, you know, there weren't, there weren't, um, I think, any, you know, um, there were no, like, avant-garde film classes in mm -hmm. universities, and, um, you know, so what's happened in the last 50 years with, the, with that, um, art schools, and so many more students just learn, you know, studying uh, art and, and, you know, I, you know, I mean, this whole, it's, it's very successful as far as like um, people being open to uh, this, this, just personal filmmaking. Uh, and also, um, that's happened worldwide. So now, you know, we're, we're looking at works from, you know, being made in China and, you know, um, you know, all over Europe and, you know, other Asian countries, so, um, which is really exciting, you know. Um, you know, like, um, I think, like, it was like, wow, it might have been like a Brackage Memorial program that happened in Japan in, like, 2004, and, you know, that, like, I think was, like, you know, where first uh, major <coughs> program of his work was shown in, in Tokyo, and, you know, we're, we're seeing, like, the films made by these were, were, you know, young people in their 20s that saw that and that, like, turned them on. You know, that was like this. And so now we're seeing, you know, 10 years later, we're, like, seeing, the, they're, you know, they're, they're making works and showing this. You know, some of these things kind of, you know, digital, you know, internet has this whole effect as well on uh, the way people can kind of see this. So the whole accessibility thing, I, I'm sometimes at a loss in understanding what you know what that what that means. You know, when, when something's described as inaccessible. So. One last one for the road. Well, this is such an obvious one because this is a how say in something like 106 River Road, do you have the image, and then how do you make the images that go over it? Like the house is one thing, and how does it happen technique wise? Do you want to? <laughs> um, I mean, probably Charlotte could uh, corroborate, but I thought that was hand-processed ectochrome. Is that what that looked like to you? <laughs> or, or, or negative, yeah. So by hand-processing. Yeah, so instead of sending um, the film to a lab to be processed sort of cleanly and professionally, you can process it yourself with either the same chemicals or similar, or maybe even a bit different chemicals, depending on if you want alternative effects. And... Um, in, in that case, it was probably done in a fairly, you know, let's say imperfect way, but on purpose. Uh, so perhaps it was done in a bucket instead of using some kind of processing tank or in a, just, or in a bathtub maybe. And so, for instance, if the film is, um, like if it's, it, basically if it's done imperfectly, you can get these weird pools of um, unprocessed image or, uh, you know, these kind of dark spots that come and they can get, different colors associated with them. The picture of the home? Well, uh, the image was photographed first, uh -huh. but then after it was taken out of the camera, um, then uh, the filmmaker would have pr then processed it himself, and, and but, but done so in a way that the image came out in this kind of unusual uh -huh. manner, yeah. So, I mean, if it had been done, done at a lab, you probably would have seen a fairly stable, properly exposed, kind of normal looking image of a house that didn't really do much beyond that, <laughs> just sit there. So, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, so a lot of filmmakers have, I think, rediscovered that too. There's a lot of interest that I've seen in a lot of, a lot of younger filmmakers um, who really like working with the chemistry and, uh, you know, black and white and color, and uh, there are a lot of things you can do very specifically to engineer very specific results or things you can do that you're maybe not sure how it'll come out, and I, I th I've met a lot of people that find that quite exciting these days. It makes it, it gives it another dimension, it makes it look so mysterious that your mind goes, what, what am, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And it, it's very fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Uh, David, when's the festival? Uh, oh, no. it's, a, it's the last week of uh, March, um, 25th through 30th. Um, yeah, and if I may make a little note. I mean, we're, we're really pleased. Um, uh, we're going to uh, have a um, week-long retrospective of the work of Tom Anderson uh, this year. And um, Steve Anker from uh, CalArts will be one of the jurors. Um, so it's, it's going to be... Gonna, um, we're really excited. It's going to be really great. So when does the charter flight from Los Angeles go to Ann Arbor? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Adam. He's organizing that now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that note, everybody's available one-on-one -on -one after, but we'd love to thank all of you for attending and checking out and hope to see you at future shows. In the, uh, the big theater still has their show still running, so they always ask that we not talk in the internal lobby, but talk in here for a bit and then out, head on out to the courtyard and we can go out for drinks or whatever as well. Thanks again, Adam, for hosting us. Thank you.